Stanford University. Well, I want to add my welcome. Welcome to all of you, all the reunion classes. I hope you're in for a mind-bending experience this morning. You already had one. And actually, we're really sitting here on top of all your memories. And that's what we want to talk about today. Before I start, though, I want to ask you a trick question. What's the one organ in your body that you would not want to get as a transplant recipient? Oh, good. You know the answer. Right. So, you know, this is the point, right? The brain is who you are. And we're going to explore this theme in a series of talks today. Really, the brain is the sum of your experience, and it's stored in your brain circuits. And I have to say that one thing is certain today, and that is that if you pay attention this morning, your brain connections you know, those spe special links that we call synapses, they will have changed, and that's going to happen whether you like it or not. Now, if you're sleeping, forget it. It won't happen. <laughs> but, you know, after all, isn't this really the big reason that you came to Stanford in the first place? It's really to tune up those pesky synapses. So when you think about brain research, often the first thing that comes to mind is medical research on brain disorders. But actually, Brain research is really much more than this. Brain research is uh, also about the healthy brain. It's about how the brain is assembled during development, it, how it learns and stores memories, how it computes, how it makes decisions. It's about society, it's about creativity, it's about enhancing human potential. The problem right now is that we actually lack many of the tools that we need to really understand the brain in all of these dimensions. And, let me just give you a, a, a sense of this. It's really a problem of scale. Uh, many of you are familiar with the pictures of brain imaging that we see from the MRI, and you're going to see some of those today. And the scale there is we see that a, um, a red blob lights up when we learn something in the brain. But actually, at the scale of nerve circuits and connections, just imagine one grain of rice contains about 10,000 nerve cells. And each nerve cell gets anywhere from uh, 1,000 to 10,000 of these connections, synapses. So we're talking really literally about millions of nerve cells in the brain and billions of synapses in the brain. And all around campus, people are working, faculty and students are actually working to understand the brain at all of these scales, from the very simplest of molecules all the way up to complex, complex behavior. And today, uh, you're going to hear about brain research that isn't just happening at the medical school. Or, you know, if you think about where it's happening on campus, you know, you think, okay, it's happening at the medical school, it's, it's happening in biology, it's happening all over the place. And actually, if we don't worry, if we don't watch ourselves, brain research probably is going to be happening at every, at every building and every location on campus. So, I think uh, what I'd like to do is start off by talking about nature and nurture and the developing brain and something about these brain circuits that I've just, um, just, you know, just, just uh, mentioned here. So when you look at a beautiful uh, painting uh, like this one by Seurat, the first thing that you notice is that it's an image of a woman. In fact, it's an image of a woman at, um, at the bath. But the amazing thing is that this painting has been synthesized, right, from little t dots of paint, pointillisme, so these little, and you somehow have the gestalt of this woman that emerges from all of these thousands of little dots that Seurat put on the cam canvas. Now, our ability to see this incredible image really depends upon those very circuits in the brain. And those circuits and cells are really what underlie every aspect of our behavior, of our ability to see the world, to hear the world, to produce actions, you know, go Stanford, to, uh, and, uh, and, and to think and actually uh, 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 to plan and make decisions. And some of those are the subjects that we're going to talk about today from our uh, distinguished panelists. Now, those cells and circuits are assembled 
during development by genetic programs that are written in our genes, in our DNA, and they're read out by these genetic programs. But if everything in the brain were hardwired, then really the world would be incredibly dull and boring. We would all be like robots and we'd all be the same. And the marvelous thing about the brain is that in addition, there are also genetic programs that let our brains change with learning and experience and really essentially uh, cultivate our brains and make them our own so that each of our brains is unique based on our experiences. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I'm going to do that by uh, giving you an example from my favorite part of the brain, the visual system. But before I do that, I actually want to give you a crash course in Neuro 101. So let me just remind you what a nerve cell is. So a nerve cell consists of a number of parts. It consists of dendrites. These are the receiving parts of your brain. These are what get information from other nerve cells. It also consists of a sending part of the brain, the nerve, uh, the, the nerve cell. These are called the nerve terminals. These parts of the, brain, of, the, of the nerve actually transmit information from one nerve cell to the next. So if you actually put nerve cells together in what would be a simple circuit, you can see this. There's also a cell body which integrates information coming from all of the dendrites. And there's this really long cable, the axon, or the nerve fiber, which is what sends information from one part of the brain to another, like the eye to the visual part of the brain. And in many ways, the most critical part of the brain are the connections between one nerve cell and the next. These are called the synapses, or the junctions between one cell, nerve cell from the next. And this is where the electrical signal that is sent from along the axon is turned from an electrical impulse into a chemical signal, which actually um, which, which, uh, diffuses across this synapse, the gap between the nerve cells, and then causes the next nerve cell along to send an electrical signal. So nerve cell signaling is actually a combination of electrical and chemical signaling. And it's at these special synapses where drugs work. Prozac works at these synapses. Dopamine works at these synapses. And these are the things that change in your brain if you're paying attention. These synapses get stronger or weaker, and during development, they grow or regress. So this is where all the action is in the brain. Now, if we look at a real circuit in the brain, for instance, the circuit that goes from the eye to the visual part of the brain called the visual cortex, then the point that I want to make is that this circuit is very beautifully and strictly organized in the adult brain. So the rods and cones in your eye uh, actually capture light energy from the visual world and turn that light energy into a neural signal. And that neural signal is sent to the output neurons of your eye, these little red, uh, the little red dots in the eye here. Those are the cell bodies in the eye. And those nerve cells then send their long fibers or axons to the first relay station in the brain called the LGN. And there, nerve cells get their input from the eyes and send to the next part of the brain called the visual cortex. And what you'll notice immediately about all these connections is that they're sorted according to eye, right eye, left eye, red, green, unless you're colorblind. Sorry if you are. But, but right eye, left eye. So these, the, the connections are not randomly organized. They're beautifully segregated into red and green layers and red and green patches. So when neuroscientists first looked at this pattern, they thought, how does this happen in development? It must be hardwired. It's much too beautiful and precise to be uh, left to chance. But in fact, there are big surprises when you study the development of this system. And the first surprise is that actually, to begin with, the eye and the brain are not even connected to each other. The nerve fibers in the eye actually have to grow out of the eye toward the brain, and they have to find the visual part of the brain, the LGN, and grow into that part of the brain. And this happens unerringly during early development. And the reason this happens is because the genetic instructions for, for linking up the eye and the visual part of the brain are hardwired. 
So these genetic instructions are hardwired, and there is a blueprint of brain wiring. So the eye goes to the visual part of the brain, the ear goes to the auditory part of the brain, and so on and so forth. But here's the interesting thing. Once the connections actually grow into the target, the LGN, the visual part of the brain, there's a big surprise. And the surprise is that the adult pattern of connections is not present initially during development. It actually has to emerge during development. So the mature pattern where you have these nice green and red layers is not there. And instead, synapses that come from the output neurons of the eye remodel. They actually grow and strengthen, and other ones are eliminated. So the adult pattern is not present to start with. And what's even more um, interesting is that neural signaling from the eye to the brain has to happen for this process to happen normally. And if signaling is blocked, then the immature pattern of connections persists and is stabilized. So a complicated process of signaling from eye to the brain is required for the adult pattern to come about. And this happens during an early critical period of development, actually when the signaling itself is required. And if the signaling is altered in any way, for instance in utero by drugs of abuse, then this process is thought to be perturbed. And I'm going to co I'll come back to that in a minute. But here's another mystery. The other mystery is that this development from eye to relay station happens before birth. In fact, it happens in us of, during the end of, by the end of the first trimester. It definitely happens before vision is possible. And it happens before the rods and the cones in your eye are even there. So what kind of signaling could be sent from the eye to the brain? And the amazing thing is, it's a kind of spontaneous signaling process. In fact, it's a process in the presence of way, uh, it, it's a process that's like waves of telephone calls that are being placed by the output neurons of the eye and sent to the target neurons in the LGN, almost like address verification. So these phone calls are being placed throughout development. And I want to show you one real experiment because we can actually watch the phone calls happening during this developmental period by peering into the eye of a mouse in this case. Same thing happens in mice, that happens in us, that happens in cats, that happens in dogs, everything. So if you peer into the eye during development, you can watch these phone calls being placed. So here's a little movie where we're watching the phone calls. Every black dot here is a nerve cell. And when there's a big area turns black here, it's when neighborhoods of nerve cells in the eye are literally placing phone calls and sending phone calls, sending signals to the, to the brain. And those signals are being used to ring the phones of the nerve cells in the LGN to check addresses and check whether or not the, the uh, connections are correct. And if they're correct, they're stabilized. If they're incorrect, they're remodeling. They're remodeled and removed. So this process of auto-dialing is occurring actually throughout development. And it's not just occurring it from the eye to the brain. It's actually occurring throughout the nervous system. So now neuroscientists think that when the baby kicks in utero, it's actually rehearsing for movement. And this process of auto-dialing is happening in the spinal cord. And it's similar in the visual system. These waves actually are used as a kind of rehearsal for vision. And in the visual system, what happens is that first, these rehearsals are being performed from I to LGN, to the relay station. And these rehearsals are automatic, spontaneous auto-dialing. But then, after birth, vision takes over. And vision places the phone calls. And when that happens, we see, and the connections from the LGN to the visual cortex are then being tuned up. And then there's another critical period of development where vision is essential for the tuning up of those brain circuits. And there are critical periods all over the brain where using your brain is essential for tuning up brain circuits. And it doesn't just end with development. In fact, you're using your brain right now. And although the, the remodeling of these synapses isn't as extensive, using your brain now also is changing those synapses in your brain. And that is leading to lasting memories and learning. So you could, so 
you could ask the question now, how does this process of brain circuit tuning by experience work in the context that I showed you originally of genes and cells and circuits and behavior? And the answer is really that there's another genetic program that's driven by using your brain. And that program, too, has to work through genes to change gene expression, which leads to changes in cells and circuits, which leads to memory, lasting memory, changes in behavior, learning, and so on. So both nature and nurture essentially have to work through genes and, and, and this genetic program. And that's important because, you know, you read often about a new gene has been discovered that causes autism or a new gene that has been discovered that's associated with, uh, with uh, Alzheimer's. And these genes can be associated either because they're important in the maintenance of neural uh, circuits and function from the very beginning of development or because they are important in translating your experience of the world into lasting changes in synapses in your brain, uh, even in adult life. So now you could say this kind of process of experience-dependent circuit tuning seems awfully risky. You know, why are we doing this? Why not just hardwire everything in development to be on the safe side? And actually, there are lots of good answers. The main answer is that it's the way we adapt to the world. And it is the way that you and I are different from each other. Even if we were genetically identical as clones, our experiences of the world would make our brains different. And frankly, if you cloned Fido, you wouldn't get your lovely Fido unless you also trained Fido in the same way and Fido had the same experiences. And this is kind of adaptability is really what gives us the diversity of our brains and behavior. And, you know, we don't know where we're going to be born. So a good example is language. Uh, we might be born here, we might be born in France, we might be born, you know, anywhere, right? And it's this adaptability that actually allows us to learn and adapt to our world around us. So I think with that, I, I will, because uh, I don't want, I, I know we have so many exciting things to talk about today, and this kind of primer of Neuro 101, I'd like to now continue, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, who's going to continue in this, uh, and we're not going to have any questions yet. We're going to please, in fact, I want to say something about that. Okay, you're paying attention? If you've got good questions, there are four, uh, there are going to be four microphones, you can get up and ask those questions, and I, I'm hoping we're going to have enough time. I see that I haven't used up all my time. Remember that, everybody? So, uh, so I hope you'll have lots of questions to ask at the end of the talk. But I'd like to now continue in this theme of, of learning and how we learn and, you know, studying students and the sort of underlying mechanisms of learning by introducing our next speaker, Professor Carol Dweck, who's the uh, Lewis and Virginia Eaton Professor of Psychology, and she's going to talk about mindsets. So, Carol. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.